we're trying to find a little humor in this thing we call life. Okay. Well, I knew that today was going to be sparsely attended with the, um, uh, does that mean bonus? Uh, no. With the canoe races and whatnot. Um, but in all seriousness, how did the, uh, the last homework go? I think I tried to make it harder than a little. Yeah. Okay. I, I, if anything, that's probably the challenge because um, it, like, it objectively is easy. Okay, it, it, it objectively is. So, um, but it can be hard if you think more about it than you need. So, okay. Today we're going to get into continuously braced beams, um, and um, so so. We're going to be dealing with two types of beams this semester, and those are continuously braced beams and discreetly braced beams. So the first thing we kind of need to talk about is bracing. Like, what am I talking about? And then, uh, bless you. Uh, and then what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to take a beam and look at it from its, th at its three primary um, limits, moment, shear, and deflection. So like shear and moment diagrams, like looking at the shears, looking at the moments, and then see how much it performs. Um, and what we're really going to focus on are some analysis issues. Um, because you all took that, that structural analysis class last semester, but we're going to try and um, soft pedal a lot of the structural analysis in here through a lot of analysis aids. If you remember, the very last week of last semester, I talked about these. And I said, we're going to use them next semester. Well, we're using them. Okay, so let's get right into it. Okay, so does everybody kind of generally understand what I'm talking about with MP and ZX? Like, so the idea is that <coughs> the yield moment says that the very, very tippy, tippy top or the very, very bottom of a section reaches FY. But the plastic moment says the whole thing reaches FY. Uh, and we can compute the plastic moment by taking FY times this new section property called ZX. And ZX is just the area times the moment arm for all the rectangular, um, or for, for all the areas in, in the shape. It could be rectangular, it could be anything. Um, and the moment arms are defined from the plastic neutral axis, where the area above equals the area below. Okay, so today I want to talk about continuously braced beams, but I do need to take a sec and talk about bracing, okay? So for steel beams in general, Okay, so I want to make a couple of statements. Okay, so for steel beams, I am saying that their maximum possible flexural capacity is MP. That is the maximum amount of moment that you could put on a beam, period. Now, to, to be, if, if, if we really want to be clear, um, you actually probably could put a little bit more on, on, on some beams. I mean, I've, I've seen this in the lab, you know, this happens, you can put more on there. But for the purposes of like, what could be a theoretical upper bound, MP is, a, is about where it's at, okay? Now, I want to be clear that MP is not the flexural capacity of every beam, it is just its maximum possible capacity, okay? What I'm getting at is buckling, okay? Um, as we discussed last time, a beam has part of its cross-section in compression. And things in compression like the buckle. Beams have a very particular way of buckling. Okay? Um, uh, beams, uh, the top of the, if we're talking about positive bending, the top of the beam is experiencing compression, the bottom is experiencing tension. The beam doesn't really know what to do with that other than to do this whole kick out and twist thing called lateral torsional buckling, which we'll talk about later. Um, okay, so like Columns, beams, they, they, they have an issue with stability. Now, if you remember with columns, what we would do with a column is we would say, okay, here's the column. Let's say the column is 20 foot long, and we might have, you know, we might have a column with a load on it, something like that, that's like pin, pin, okay? Now, this column is 20 foot long, but one of the things we might do to improve this column's capacity is we might put a brace, you know, right here, right? With me so far? Okay? So, the point I am making is that there is a difference in this column between how long the column is and what is the distance between braces. So, for example, for this column, this column might be... 
20 foot long, right? That column might be 20 foot long, right? But for the purposes of capacity, we might use this distance, which we have a name. We call that KL, right? And KL might be 10 feet, right? So there is a difference between the length of the column and the effective length for capacity. And the effective length for the capacity with columns, assuming everything is pin pin, the effective length for columns is the distance between braces. Okay? So with beams, there is a similar term. Beam capacity is a function of bracing, or more specifically, how far apart it is between braces. Okay? And so the distance between braces is what we're going to call LB. Okay? LB is the unbraced length, okay? how far it is between braces. Now, um, the first thing that I think I want to mention is what am I talking about when I say braces? Okay? So a couple of real-world examples of what I mean when I say braces. So in bridge land, what we're talking about are literally braces, right? So in, in bridge land, they tend to uh, uh, take the form of either cross uh, frames or diagrams, so sort of like these mini trusses, you know, in between the uh, beams, or diagrams just be like a solid channel between the, the frames and whatnot, that's possible uh, as well. And what these are serving to do is brace the beam against buckling, because the buckling phenomenon tends to be this kick out and twist kind of effect. Let me see if I can show you a picture of LTB. I think it's right here. I, we're we're going to talk about this later, but this will load up. So this is what lateral torsional buckling looks like in the field. This is a failure uh, from a bridge in Canada in 2015. And so those braces are trying to prevent the girder from moving laterally because if it does, this can happen and this is not good, right? So with me so far? Okay. <coughs> so one real world example of bracing is just that braces. In building land, we tend to not do that very often because in building land, what happens is the other beams framing in act as braces. So for example, in this building, there's probably beams going this way, but remember, there's beams going this way, but then the girders frame into the beams, right? So for example, if you go to the, I know it's concrete, but if you go to the 3rd Avenue parking garage, you can see these ribs, these concrete beams going this way, sort of in the direction like towards 3rd Avenue, but there are these larger elements going perpendicular to that and the beams frame into the girders. So those beams, if it was steel, those beams would sort of act as braces for the girder. Okay, does that make sense? I'm using that example because, I mean, you can go and look at it right now. Okay. <coughs> All right. So, I want to make sure that we're clear on denoting the difference between the length of a beam and its unbraced length. And I'm going out on about this because I've been teaching steel for a long time. This is probably the one thing that tends to be pretty confusing uh, when you first start looking at beams is there is a difference between how long a beam is and its unbraced length. For example, if I have a simply supported beam like this, the physical length of the beam might be, I don't know, 30 feet long. So what we would say in this case is we might say that the length is 30 feet, okay? But for this beam, we might have braces framing in. So like, let's say if we're looking at it in 3D, we might have a brace here. And then we might have, I don't know, a brace here. And then the distance between these braces is, I don't know, 10 feet, right? So that would be these braces framing in right here. And so what we might say here is LB is 10 feet. Okay, does that make sense? So there is a difference between the actual length of the beam and the unbraced length. And what I would say is that the actual length of the beam is necessary for the structural analysis. Like you need L, L, in order to compute a, or draw a shear diagram or a moment diagram or what have you. But LB is what we're gonna need to compute the strength of the beam, okay? Now, just to, to um, clarify, we're actually not gonna directly use the term LB for about a week or so, okay? And the reason why is that I've given you some examples of discreetly braced beams right here. These are beams that have discrete braces every so on. Okay, what we're going to do for the first couple lectures is assume continuous bracing. 
And continuous bracing would be like, imagine that literally every single point has a brace. So much so that the braces are so close together that we're essentially going to say LB is zero. Okay? So when we say a beam is continuously braced, um, what we're essentially saying is that we're not going to consider buckling. That's basically what we're saying. Now, some of you might think, hold on, Dr. Mike, like, can you really do that in the real world? Like, is there ever a scenario where a beam is continuously braced? And the answer is actually yes, and this is a real good example of it, okay? So this is a beam that is, we would consider to be continuously braced, because of the shear studs and the cast concrete that's serving as the floor system, right? So we have our uh, steel beam. We shoot shear studs on the top flange. So shear studs are these welded anchors that we weld to the top flange. And then when we place the concrete deck that serves as the floor system, these anchors lock, they, 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 um, the, the concrete cures around them, and so the beam really cannot translate left or right because it's literally held in place by these, these headed anchors, okay? So in this condition, we would say that LB is zero, okay? So if you want a conceptual picture in your head for the types of beams that we're looking at for the next few lectures, this is going to be a good example of what I'm talking about. Now, <clears throat> I will say that we are sort of um, cheating a little bit because in composite beams like this, you can't account for the concrete deck. We're not going to do that in here, but you can, okay? Uh, but that's sort of a discussion for a later day. Okay, so let's, let's get to this like a limit state problem, okay? Remember like with tension members, we have gross section yielding, we have net section fracture, we have block shear rupture. Man, I don't know about you, but, but tension members, that seems like such a long time ago, doesn't it? Seems like ages ago, right? But with tension members, we have various limit states. And for each one of those limit states, what we're checking is the load against the resistance. And as long as the resistance is greater than or equal to the load, we are good to go, okay? Um, now, for, um, for, for beams, we have three conditions that we're mostly assess uh, assessing in most cases. That is the moment capacity, so we want the factored moment resistance to be greater than or equal to the factored moment. We want the factored shear resistance to be greater than or equal to the factored loads, uh, factored shears, and the deflection. So we want the deflections to be less than or equal to some limit, okay? Um, I want to say a couple things about what we're about to do for the next few weeks. The first thing I want to talk about is shear, okay? Um, Shear is not really going to be a problem for most routine building beams, okay? You're going to see what I mean when we start doing some math, but we're going to find scenarios for most of our problems where the shear load is something like 20 kips, but the corresponding shear capacity is going to be like 130 kips. Like steel W sections, just by their inherent nature, just have an inordinate amount of shear capacity. Um, that isn't always the case um, in building design. So, for example, any element in a building that has a really short span and a really high load, you tend to have to worry about shear, like transfer girders. Um, and in bridges, shear becomes a thing in bridges. Um, but in routine beams and buildings, shear just tends to not be a problem. So we're going to look up the, uh, shear capacity uh, using a design aid, and then near the end of the semester, I'm going to teach you how to actually compute it. Um, the other thing is deflections. Deflections are much more straightforward than they are in reinforced concrete. You had reinforced concrete, right? So you know that in reinforced concrete, you have to consider that part of the section is cracked, part of it is not. So you have to do an effective moment of inertia, and then you have creep and long-term deflections. You probably know what I'm talking about in concrete design. In steel, you don't have to worry about any of that, okay? In steel, it's all very straightforward. It's very plug and chug very elastic rubber band style behavior, okay? So that, that part will be pretty easy. So what about uh, each of these? So for moments, what is the flexural capacity of a continuously braced beam? Well, assuming it's compact, the flexural capacity is just MP, FYZX. Now, uh, a couple design aids that I want you to sort of bookmark, one of them is table 3-2. This is, without a doubt, one of the most useful tables in the manual, okay? We will use it a lot. And I will tell you this, there are <coughs> a 
all sorts of values in this table, like what the heck is this LP and LR? What is feed BF, you know? Um, I don't expect you to understand any of that right now. You will later, okay? But suffice it to say, we are going to make very heavy use of this table, and by the time the semester is over, you will know what all these mean, okay? Um, but I want to reference um, this table because it computes the shear capacity, and we'll be able to just look it up, okay? Um, if you open table 3.2, you will notice a, an oddity about how the sections are organized. Table 3.2 is often referred to as the ZX table, okay? So much so that I probably won't even call it table 3.2. I'll just call it the ZX table. And when you look at the ZX table, you will notice an interesting way in which the sections are grouped. First off, if you follow the sections, you'll see they're organized by their ZX, that the ZX values descend as you go through the table, okay? But does anybody notice how they're grouped? Like you'll see a group of like six or seven, and then the top row is bolded. Do you see that? Because you see that, right? Because you, you for the door being, didn't you? Okay, bring it out. Bring it out. Does anybody notice what's going on with those groups? Like why within a given group, why is the top row bolded in a given group? Why is that? What's the deal with the top row in any given group? What's different? So if you have a group of like six or seven shapes, why is the top row bolded in that group? What is it about that section in that group? The largest what? Uh, web. Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, let's just take a look at this group. Maybe look at the second number. What is it about this number compared to all these? It's the heaviest. It's what? It's the heaviest. No, it's not the heaviest. It's the lightest. It's the lightest. So the ZX table is organized by ZX, but what happens is they're grouped, and within a given group, this section is the lightest. Okay, these set shapes are sometimes referred to as the economy sections. They are they have a little bit of a higher, usually a higher rate of production, you know, from a mill standpoint. But these are the sections that are the most economical from a bending standpoint. So a lot of times we use those for design. Okay, now the only other thing I think that we need to talk about before we can get into an example is serviceability. Do you remember in tension member land how we said that there are strength limit states and there are service limit states? Do you all remember that? Remember that strength limit states are to ensure the safety of the structure. And because we've got, you know, if we, the, the, the idea that if we violate a strength limit state that the building's going to fall down and kill people, because that's a, a situation, we use factored loads, right? We use 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live, et cetera. And we take factored loads and we compare them to factored resistances. That's what we do for strength limit states. Service limit states are intended for something entirely different. So an example of a service limit state is the slenderness check on tension members. Remember how we said L over R needs to be less than or equal to 300? And why was that a limit? It had nothing to do with the building falling down and killing people. It had to do with if you violate L over R, the... the um, the element just gets kind of flimsy for handling, right? Just kind of gets difficult to handle with a crane, right? Service limit states deal with the day-to-day -day performance of the structure. They're not, they're not there to uh, uh, guard against safety. So this is probably the biggest takeaway for service limit states. A service limit state that we are going to check in here is deflection limits. And in deflection land, you do not use load factors. You do not use 1.2 dead or 1.6 live. You just use live. You just use dead. And for most of our deflection limits, we're just going to use live loads. Okay? Um, so the two takeaways, do not use load factors when assessing deflections. Do not use load factors. Okay? That's an easy mistake to make. Okay? So that's definitely noteworthy. And again, deflections in beams, in steel beams, it's much more straightforward. <laughs> Another table that I think you should tab 
It's table 322. Y'all recognize these, by the way? Turn to table 322. Y'all recognize these? Have you seen something like this before? You haven't seen this before? Oh, boy, don't you, don't you do that. I got scared for you. Y'all remember this last semester from structural analysis? Remember how there are these aids that we can use to determine uh, uh, responses on structures? And it, you, it, you look at this and you go, why did we have to do all those shear and moment diagrams, Dr. Mike? We just look it up. Well, it's because I wanted you to learn something. Yeah. No, but for routine structural analysis cases, we can look up all of our resulting analyses uh, from Table 322. There's a lot of really good uh, 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 cases there. Um, we're going to use those today. So um, I just want to make sure that that's uh, uh, known, noteworthy. Okay. Sound good? All right. Let's, let's see about analyzing a beam. So what we're going to do today is analyze this beam in order to verify its performance. So this is analysis land. So in analysis land, we are given the beam and we are just ensuring that it meets performance. Whereas in design land, we're going to select a beam to resist these loads. Okay? So let's analyze this beam in order to verify its capacity. Okay? So it's a... <coughs> So W21 by 62, um, we got A992 steel, um, FY is 50 KSI. Um, we've been given the loads, given the, resi uh, the resistance, and we are going to assume a continuous bracing, okay? Um, we're going to verify all three limit states, moments, shears, and deflections. Now, a couple things. The deflection limit is a live load deflection limit. So what we're going to ensure that the beam meets the deflections only considering its live loads, which is a very common thing in steel design because we can usually get around dead load deflections. So one of the ways that we get around dead load deflections is through what's called cambering. So, for example, if I do the math, let's just make up the numbers. If I do the math and the beam deflects three quarters of an inch under dead load, under the weight of all that wet concrete and all that, what I can do is I can actually physically permanently bend the beam upwards three quarters of an inch, put it in the structure so that when I cast the concrete, the beam sits flat, okay? That process is called cambering, okay? So really the only deflections that you can't really get around uh, 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 handling in the field are the live loads. So that's why you have live load deflection limits. So um, that's, that's why that's, that's there. Okay. So far so good? Okay. All right, so we're going to analyze this beam in order to verify its capacity. Now, in order to do that, there's a couple things that I want to look up, okay? So let's put this over here. Uh -huh. Let's put up some info here for the W21 by 62. The first thing I'm going to report is this term W sub naught. That's the term I'm going to use. And W sub naught is 62 pounds per foot. That's just how heavy the beam is, right? I don't have to look that up. A W21 by 62 weighs 62 pounds per foot. We're going to use that today. But I'm also going to say that that is zero point zero six two kips per foot. I'm going to divide that by a thousand to get that in kips. Okay. And the other thing I'm going to write down is its zx. Can somebody in table one one tell me what is its zx? <clears throat> 144. 
Anybody else able to find that? Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Just so we have that. Um, just so we have that written down. Okay. All right. Now, um, this is a simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load. So the first thing that we need to do is all of the necessary structural analysis. Okay. Now, I think for structural analysis, the best thing to do would be to go right here to table 322. Okay. So we're going to go to table 322, and we're going to go to case one. something which is going to, how can I put this? This is going to seem inefficient at first. And to be clear, it is inefficient. But I am doing it this way because for more complicated problems, it is the only way of doing it. So I'm trying to instill good calculation practice on you as students. And I'll explain what I mean about that as we, we get into it. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to consider is the dead load. So I'm considering the dead load and the live load separately. Okay, so what do I have going on with the dead load? The dead load, I have a simply supported beam. Beam, by the way? Did we say 32 feet? Yep. Okay, let me move this down just a tad. Okay. Now, how much dead load was on the beam? One kip per foot. One kip per foot, but is that the total amount of dead load on the beam? No, because there's the self weight, right? So we have W dead, which is one kip per foot. And we have W sub naught, which is 0 0.062 kip per foot. So we have that. Okay. With me so far? Okay. Now, how do I compute for this scenario the worst case shear and the worst case moment. I'm going to call those VD and MD. What is the worst case maximum shear on a simply supported beam subjected to a uniform distributed load? WL over 2, right? That's just the reaction, right? So WL over 2. Sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, I'm using this computer. I left I left all my cable, my my HDMI stuff at home. I'm like, ah, I'll use this. Okay, so what do we get for this? Sixteen point nine nine. Sixteen point nine nine. Right? Okay, now what is the moment? What is the absolute maximum moment? Get 
That's something doesn't look right. That seems big. I got 135.94. Because it's just the 32 squared over 8. And that's 1.062. Yeah, I think that does uh, that's, that's fine, that's fine. But does that make sense? So that's about 135.9 foot kips or about 135,900 foot pounds. So you want to think of it that way. Okay, so this is the dead load. Okay, now what is going on with the live load? Okay, the live load is the following. And I'll get to my inefficiency here in a second because I'm sure some of you may be a little confused. Like, what was he talking about there? Like, inefficient way of doing it. You'll see what I'm talking about. So this was 1.5 tips per foot. This is 32. So is it going to be the same formulas? Like just different load? Of course, yeah. So it's going to be, oh, oh, I, I, I'm going to fix something up here here in a second, but I'll show you what I mean. All right, so that is um, 24 kips. And I'll, I'll go ahead and give you these. Because I think at this point, you can do this. And this one ends up being 192. Okay. By the way, I have, I guess, a slight typo up here. This is kind of a typo because I sort of wrote that, wrote that down wrong. Really what it should be is um, equals that. What does that say? WD plus W naught. Like a, the the combined load. I got to make sure that I count for that. I mean, I did the math right. I just I didn't write that down. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Everybody with me so far? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's determine our factor effects. And how do I do that? Well, I say, okay, VU, 1.2 VD plus 1.6 VL. And then the same thing for MU. this when this is all said and done. We'll say to one decimal place for each. Okay, what about MU? <clears throat> Do I have a second? Say one person. So far, so good? Okay, now let's get into the inefficiency, because I'm sure some of you are thinking this, right? Ow. 
I'll do it up here on the board. Okay. This is what I did, right? What I did is I said W dead, M dead, W live, M live, and I said MU, right? What I could have done Is if I, instead, I could have taken the dead load and the live load, and I could have just said I could have done that, and then and I could have done that, right? I mean, I could have just factored the loads directly and only did one WL squared over eight, right? So. This would have been a far more efficient calculation. It would have been less button crunching on the calculator. <clears throat> okay? So I guess my question, or a natural question for you all students is, well, Dr. Mike, why didn't you do that? Okay? The reason I didn't do that is this. Okay? What if this was my problem? What if I have a simply supported beam with a dead load and then a point live load? What if the live load is not distributed? What if it's a point load? What if it's a triangular load? What if the, the load conditions are different, okay? This method would not work, okay? The only way to compute the moments is to treat them separately. So I did this problem a little inefficiently because I'm trying to get you in the habit of thinking of it this way. What are the dead load moments? What are the live load moments? Because it is those that you need to factor. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> so far, so good? Okay. <clears throat> so now that we've done the structural analysis, let's look at the capacity. Okay, so this is a continuously braced beam. For a continuously braced beam, let's make sure we're paying attention. What is its factor of capacity? Like, what is its moment capacity? What is the maximum amount of moment capacity that a beam can withstand? M P. That, that's the maximum amount of capacity that a beam can withstand, right? It's plastic moment, right? Which is going to be Fy times what term? Last letter of the alphabet. There you go. Zx, right? So this is going to be a phi value, which in this case is 0 0.9, 50 KSI. And what is Zx? Okay. Now, <clears throat> when I calculate this, what are the units going to be? KSI. So we have kips, kips per inch squared times inches to the third is going to be inch kips, right? I need to multiply this by a conversion factor to get it into foot kips, right? So I'm going to multiply it by... one foot over 12 inches to get it into foot kips, okay? So 
When I check all this out, what do I get? Second on that? Yeah. So VMN is 540 foot kips. What was MU? What did we get for MU? 470.3. Can somebody make an observation right here? What does this mean? It's good to go, right? Do you remember how to compute efficiencies or performance ratios? How do you compute an efficiency? MU divided by VMN. So what is that? We'll say three decimal places. 87, like, so we'll say 0 0.871. Is that, is that fair? So does this beam have adequate moment capacity? Yeah, it does, right? Does it seem a little over-designed? It does, right? But we have two different limit states we have left to check. We've left to check, right? One of them is shear, and one of them is deflection. Let's look at those. Now, in order to look at that, I want to go to table 3-2. Now, I want to look up a couple quantities from table 3-2. The first thing I want to look at is VMP. What is VMP for a W21 by 62? What is it? It can be a little challenging to find if it's not a bolded row, but the W121 by 62 is a bolded row. So if it's not one of the bolded rows, you might have to um, where's Waldo it a little bit. But what is the VMP for a W21 by 62? So what does that tell you? We calculated that correctly, didn't we? I mean, we, we could have looked it up, you know. But what I want to look up is the shear capacity. Because I'm not going to tell you how to compute the shear capacity until later, but there's kind of a reason for that. You're going to see why right now. What is the shear capacity? Two fifty-two. Does everybody see that? Okay, so help me out. This is 252 kips. What was VU? 58. What was that? 58.8 kips. Is everybody following along with me on that? So this is what we got from structural analysis, and this is its capacity. So is it good? Yeah, it's good. What is its performance ratio? <clears throat> Zero point two three three, right? So somebody tell me. <clears throat> What sort of hits your gut when you look at these numbers? What does it feel like? Feels like it's way over designed, doesn't it? Like way over designed. But that just kind of happens, that just kind of happens with shear, okay? All right, what matters is not that each individual limit state is 90% or better or what have you. What matters is that the worst case scenario 
is 90% or better. And we have one left to check, which is deflection. Okay, so let's look at deflection. Okay, now let's write down a couple parameters. Okay, so we have WL, which is 1.5 kips per foot. We have the length of the beam is 32 feet. We have E. What is E for steel? <coughs> and we do need the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia, I'll go ahead and tell you, for a W21 by 62 is 1330. Okay, <clears throat> and what we're going to do with these is we're going to compute the maximum live load deflection. Okay, now from table 322 for a simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load. WL to the 4th or 384 EI. Okay? I'm going to test your L's 312 memory to see if you all remember this. Okay. So it's a big calc. No load factors, just the raw loads. start hitting those buttons in your calculator. We're missing something. We need a unit conversion factor for deflections. Does anybody remember what that is for standard USCS units? Say again? 1728. Because it's 12 cubed. It, it's not 1776. Because when you do the math, you're going to have inches squared on the bottom and feet cubed on the top. So you need to get those cubic feet into cubic inches. And so 12 cubed to 1728. So now chug this out. I know we're getting close on time. So 0 0.92. Do I have a second on that? Okay. I'm going to assume yes because I know that's right. Okay. Now. This is the maximum deflection. What is the limit to that deflection? The limit was specified in the problem as L over 400, which deflection limits tend to be L over some number. So this is 32 feet over 400. And again, we need to do a unit conversion. So when you chug this out, you get 0 0.96, okay? So this is the max is 0 0.92, the limit is 0 0.96, so that means we're okay. And if you want a performance ratio for this, the performance ratio is actually pretty high. It's 0 0.958. So I guess my question for you, is this beam adequate? Yes, the beam is adequate. And in fact, the controlling limit state is deflection, which happens more often than you would think in beam design. We'll talk more about that on Monday.
Does that make sense? All right. Just to show you real quick, um, just to show you something real quick, and I'll pull this back up if you need it, but um, for your homework, <clears throat> here is the, um, the beam that you're going to have to assess, and the big point I want to make to you is that WL squared over 8 and 5WL to 4WL over 34 EI, they will not work, okay? I would look at these cases in table 323, oh, sorry, 322. Uh, that's the title, 322. But I would look at those cases um, and what have you. Um, I have a problem that has um, a dead load of one kit per foot on top of the self-weight of the beam. It's very similar, but instead of a, a um, distributed load, I have a concentrated load there at the end. Sound good? All right. That's all I got, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording, and I will um, see you all on Monday. Y'all have a wonderful weekend.